last five videos are not Okay, okay. I will Okay, now uh, the last time we talked about, we looked at the equation for a particle moving in the gravitational field of a spherically symmetric body and we found that this uh, person or whoever comes in And we found some generalities which were quite straightforward. There is some kind of effective equation uh, which is similar to the non relativistic equation. So we discussed how to uh, find basically the radial equation and we found it and the only thing is we have to assume that we are working with a massive part. Now if you look at any of the various textbooks on this subject, they make the point correctly that for a massive particle you have the option to let the parameter along the world line be the proper time and after that the formalism sort of flows and all the familiar equations follow. But when particle is massless then obviously you can't take the proper time uh, to be the parameter along the world and even the proper time doesn't go anywhere, it's just zero. <coughs> so you have to do something different. Now I always found it very disturbing why these two cases should be different and you shouldn't be able to just get one from the other and uh, there is an explanation which I am going to give you today but uh, it's not in any of it. In fact, I had earlier. Uh, it's not in any of the textbooks, at least the standard textbooks on gravity. And uh, you could argue that it's not absolutely necessary. Let's say people who are not really interested in theoretical physics may not find this very interesting. But I find it very satisfying because there's one formalism which can deal with both massive and massive particles in one go. And we also understand, at the end of it, we'll understand why the massless case has some special properties and why certain uh, why the proper time cannot actually be chosen. Physically we understand that, but we will see what is breaking down in this form. So let me discuss, so I will stop talking about, for a while I will not talk about any particular gravitational background, but just generalities of massless particles. And once we are done with that, then we will come back to static phase in the functional solution. And the first thing we we'll do then is to write down the equation for massless particles and uh, find the bending of light, okay, which is the obvious example of massless particles uh, going faster for the solution. So uh, to do that, let me remind you that uh, the, we used in the past S equals minus m square root of minus t mu. Thank you. 
Actually, remember when we derived it, we didn't get zero on the right side, but by a clever reparameterization of time of this tau parameter, we were able to make the right side zero. Then this equation was true. This equation implies the constraint that P mu P mu, by which this contraction, of course, always means P mu P mu and then G mu mu. X and this is equal to minus square. Okay. Now this was true in general, and this action is invariant under arbitrary reparameterizations. Tau goes to tau prime of tau. So this is completely general, and there is nothing more you can say of interest in complete generality. The next thing, which is extremely convenient, is to make what I'll call here a gauge choice for tau. Whenever there's an invariance like this, you can fix the invariance. The invariance simply means there's a redundancy in the description. That is, although tau appears to be there, tau by itself doesn't have any physical meaning, and so we can replace it by any other function of itself. It's fairly analogous. It's analogous, first of all, to general coordinate transformations in four dimensions. These are the same content. You see that it's like a miniature version of that, one-dimensional version of that. Okay, <coughs> and we can fix it, which corresponds to choosing a particular coordinate, which we often do, just for our convenience. Okay. Now, one particular such gauge choice for tau says, let's just fix minus d mu nu x dot mu x dot mu equals 1 or 2 or 10 or anything to feel like. or even a function of tau which we have predetermined cos of tau sin of tau anything but in particular 1 is the simple one ok now this is the one which gives the tau is the proper term that I think you know because if you just take the denominator on the other side you find d tau squared is minus g mu nu dx mu dx mu, which is the definition of proper term. So from this point of view, there is nothing special about the proper term, but we are allowed to choose it. Okay, that's the conclusion. And only when we choose it, then you see this denominator disappears, and then p is m times x dot. Okay, and this gives us a nice identification that then p mu is m x dot mu. So, x dot mu can be really, well, I don't know how you want to think of it. Normally, we write p mu is m times u mu, where u mu is the forward four velocity. But in general, if we hadn't made this choice, then u mu would be all of this without the factor of m. It would be x dot over all this stuff. Very complicated function of x dot. Okay. But in the gauge choice where tau is proper time, then p is m times x dot and this formula together with this formula is what we have been using all throughout the course. Now the problem is that this entire business on the blackboard goes to hell if I put m to 0 because then s is 0 and there doesn't seem to be anything we can do. So that is the problem. So here is the, so let's try to find a solution to that. No sense. We don't seem to have any action, therefore we can't have any equations of motion. But physically it can't be so bad because photons do exist and they should have equations of motion, they should follow the basics. So something is wrong with this starting assumption. Now let me remind you that what we want is an action with this key property and which gives some kind of sensible geodesic equation of motion. That's its equation. Okay. And what we will do now is to take seriously the idea that this <coughs> is a miniature version of general relativity. Miniature being that it applies in a one dimensional space time instead of a four dimensional space time. In fact, that one dimensional space time has only time and no space. Because it's a world. 
Now, if we are trying to do something which has general coordinate invariance, we have learned from general relativity. This is also the reason I am telling it to you now rather than the beginning of the course because we have built up a lot of experience. We have learned that the best way to implement general coordinate invariance is to have a metric on the space. Okay. Right now in this discussion, we have never introduced any metric on the world line. Okay. So that is what we are going to do now. Introduce metric. Now I will put these things in quotes because it is not a physical object. Where the world line isn't a physical space, it's not the space we live in, it's a different space for every moving particle. Okay? So just introduce a metric on the world line. But since the world line is one dimensional, the metric will be a one by one matrix depending on one variable. So it's just a simple function. And to not confuse it with the metric of space time that we also have, I'll call it capital G. Okay. So let me introduce this and then let me make the rule that distances along the world line ds world line squared by definition okay, like this. This is nothing but the miniature version in one dimension of the usual rule for distances that ds squared is minus g mu nu dx mu dx. Here all the mu and mu matrices just take the single value tau. Okay. But of course we want this quantity to be invariant under the parameterizations of tau. So g cannot really be just a function, even though it has no indices. Actually, it has secretly it has two indices, just that both those indices take the single possible value tau. So actually, we must have that g prime of tau prime is d tau by now. I have this bad habit, I am not able to distinguish partial and I am not able to decide between partial and this, so if I can do other. But this is it. This is just the law of transformation of an metric which you have seen many times when applied to a one dimensional space. And this together with the chain rule that d tau prime equals d tau prime by d tau d tau, these two things leave Yes, or square, invariant under changes. Exactly as we would like. Okay. Yes. Very good. Okay. Now with this formalism, let's think about writing um, an action that will do the job for us, but let us not be tied to this action anymore. Let us try to think what would be the natural way to write an action which involves this world line metric. So new action and it will turn out that it comes in two parts. Part one of the action is whatever is the most sensible thing you can write, uh, <coughs> which is quadratic in the coordinate. It's a very simple action. And the way I will build it up is to say, first of all, there has to be integral d tau. But in a reparameterization invariant theory, it must be accompanied by a root of delta of the metric because that combination is invariant. Okay, except that this metric is anyway one dimensional, so its determinant is the same as itself. Possibly, if I had been more careful, g should have, I am not sure whether I should have used g or minus g. But anyway, I'll, I think it won't matter. Okay, so d tau root g. Okay, now what I want to do is write something that's quadratic in the x in the coordinates of the particle. So of course, the only way I can make something quadratic which is consistent with space-time reparameterization invariance is this. Except for one thing, I have to realize that. Here, these are derivatives d x mu d tau d x mu d tau. But whenever I differentiate, I have got one lower index, so I need to have a inverse metric in front. Okay, that is just capital G 
and you can see right away by inspection that this thing is invariant under reparameterization of tau because this gets a Jacobian factor which cancels with this g. That's a consequence of what we have here. While here, these two get factors from the chain rule which cancel with the single factor coming in g and s. Okay, so the whole thing is invariant. It's very much the analog of writing a Klein Gordon action in four dimensions, where the Klein Gordon field appears in place of x and space time appears in place of tau. The miniature version of four dimensional gravity. It's the version, it's the gravity which is describing the reparameterization in very world line of the world. So this is it. Okay. This is of course very simple and it's quadratic in x, which is very nice. And we can also combine these two factors root g and g inverse. So we can just write it as beta now over this one point. So root g and g inverse this combined to give one over. So this is good. Sir, there's, yes. no, there's no mass in this. There's no mass in this action, and that's why I'm not yet done. This is an action that I'm calling S1. And before I start to work with this action, I'm going to ask whether given the variables that I have available to me which are x mu and this world, this world line metric capital G, are there any other terms I can write to add to this? It, it's always good to write the most general terms which involve some minimum number of derivatives and then see whether you need them or you don't. Now since this is miniature gravity, you might think that there should be a term integral d tau root g times r of the, where r is the Riemann curvature of this particle world line. But unfortunately, as you probably guessed already, this is not there because the Riemann curvature of the particle world line is zero. The reason for that is that r has to have, first of all, this is the Ricci scalar. It's obtained by trace of the Ricci tensor, which is obtained by a trace of the Riemann tensor. Now the Riemann tensor has four slots, okay, and it's anti-symmetric in the first pair and last pair of indices. But in this miniature gravity, all the slots can only be occupied by tau, and anti-symmetric makes that thing zero. Okay. It's also consistent with our idea that on a line, on a one-dimensional trajectory, you can't very well parallel transport yourself here and there and come back with anything different. Because the only, first of all, it's just a it's just a line in time, okay. But even if you do transport, you always have to come back exactly the way you went. So there's really no loop you can carry out which will uh, which will give you some curvature or something. So there's no curvature, in short. So there's no such curve. No analog of demand curve.
S equals S1 plus S2 equals a half integral V tau 1 by root G C mu minus M The good thing about this action is it's quadratic in x of tau, so it's liable to be easy to solve. In fact, in quantum, uh, in quantizing particle motion in a gravitational field, this is a use useful way to do it because quantum mechanics for an action like x dot square is relatively easy, and quantum me mechanics for an action like square root of minus x dot square is absolutely horrible. It really makes a difference when you do quantum mechanics. It's not such a big difference when you do classical mechanics, which is why we managed all this time. Anyway, so here is the action and now our job is to find its equation for motion. Okay. First, please take a look again and convince yourself that it is perfectly invariant under tau goes to tau prime of tau because of the transformation properties of d tau, root g and the zero roots. Everything fits together perfectly. And there isn't much you can add to it unless you want to add higher order terms in x. So this is pretty much it. Now the equations of motion will be of two types. One is the equation involving variation of this new variable g of tau. This will be a single equation because g has a single component. Okay. And what is the equation you get? You get the equation 1 by g of tau g into Okay, good. So 
So now you can see that because P comes, so you see that P relation of P with X dot is not what was familiar to us. There's a the earlier relation of P with X dot was P is X dot upon some square root stuff. Now there's no square root stuff. That's a very nice thing. On the other hand, there's square root of G. The square root stuff I was referring to was square root of X dot square. Here that is merely square root of g, but this is enough. If you take this and plug it in there, you find that p mu p mu g mu p plus equals zero. So this is very good. This says that I've got all the constants right, and this action, despite being only quadratic in x, and despite not having any funny square root of x dot square, still reproduces the correct partial condition for a particle. Now it's an easy exercise to see that if you take the equations of motion for x, that is del x del del x del x mu equals zero, so this equation comes out to be x double dot mu plus gamma mu mu lambda x dot mu lambda minus a half g dot on g. This shouldn't be totally a surprise to us because even last time when we used the square root action, the geodesic equation we got wasn't just this, but it had an extra term. Okay, and the extra term, if you remember from then, was some d by dt or some log, and this time it's also d by dt of log. This thing is d by dt of log g. Okay, but there's another interpretation to this which immediately tells us what is going on. Can you guess what is the meaning of half g dot by g? In this miniature form of gravity, it's some kind of one-dimensional gravity. The metric is g. What objects do we normally associate with, associate with first derivatives of the metric? The Christoffel symbols. And in fact, the Christoffel symbol is nothing but all this very trivial calculation: gamma, tau, tau, tau. Second term minus third term, which cancel each other, is a half. So this is just gamma of tau. And now you see that this equation takes the form of something which expresses that x double dot, x single dot, x dot mu, which is the velocity. Its derivative in time, plus a term coming from the curvature of space-time, but also minus a term coming from the metric on the world line, is zero. So this is some kind of fully covariant derivative, including both the space-time effect and the world line effect of metrics, both the metrics coming from this equation and the whole thing together is zero. Okay, so it's very closely related to the geodesic equation, and it will become exactly the geodesic. So the equations make perfect sense. Okay, it's really 
related to your question about pullback. So this one is really the effect of the pullback Christoffel connection of space time and this is the intrinsic Christoffel connection of the world. Okay. We did not worry ourselves about this too much. Let us uh, go back to this equation and notice that it allows us to eliminate g as long as m is non-zero. So let us do that. Whenever you, somebody gives you an action which has a variable like capital G which does not appear with any derivatives, it is just appearing algebraically, you can write its equations of motion, solve them and eliminate that uh, variable from the action and forget about it forever. Okay. So what is the solution? This is the equation and its solution is g of tau is equal to minus g mu mu x dot mu on it square. Now let us plug this back into the original action. Then we will get the action with this variable removed. <coughs> and in fact, typically what happens, both terms will be this will get equal up to some factor of 2 or something. And finally, the exact answer you get is minus m integral d tau root of minus So here is one of the big messages. The action that we had always worked with is the same as the new action we are working with as long as m is non-zero. Okay. However, if m is zero, this action has a perfectly sensible limit by dropping the second term. But if you drop this term, you drop this term from the, this equation and now you are not able to eliminate capital G. Because capital G, remember, is everywhere non-zero. It's a metric, so it's non-singular, so it's non-zero. So it just says that the rest of the thing is zero. It gives you absolutely no information about G. Equivalently, this equation makes no sense when it is zero. Therefore, this action makes no sense when it is zero. So the fact that this action vanishes at m equals zero is totally fake. It's simply because this is not the right action when m is zero. That's the right action when m is this action is right for all m and this action is right only for this. Okay. So this process is simply not possible, it is not legitimate. Note that it is not a Lagrange multiplier in this instance. 
it's an algebraic variable, so you can eliminate it, but its, uh, it's appearance in this term and this term are different. Okay, that's not called a Lagrange multiplier. Lagrange multiplier is something which multiplies the whole Lagrange. Okay, or multiplies the whole thing that you want to set it to zero. And that's the case over here. That's its role. Moreover, it implements the invariance under tau goes to tau, tau prime of tau because this, this and the dots over here all conspire to make this invariant. Without G, there is no way you could make this thing invariant under tau goes to tau, tau prime of tau. So it is still playing a role. That is very important to realize. It always plays a role. Now, we come to the question, how do we fix, how do we gauge fix? What we've been doing for the last ten lectures, but we haven't used these words. Okay, so here's one answer. Eliminate. So this answer. Okay, let's first see how to make it fix tau goes to tau prime of tau. So now we have a branch. We have method one only for m not equal to zero. Okay. Eliminate G, that's the first step. The next step, of course, that's this. Equations of motion by varying fields arbitrarily, and then after you got those equations, 
then you can set some field to some value as allowed by your gain symmetry in your problem. Okay. So G's role in that case is just to give the equation of motion G mu nu x dot mu x dot mu plus m square equal to zero. This is what it does. And now we set it to one. So this equation still remains in the system. Okay. Now see, because of this equation, x dot mu is a constraint variable. That was not the case before. In the square root formalism, which we used earlier, which you get after eliminating capital G, x dot mu is a free variable. It's not constraint. But here, it's subject to this constraint. So you're not allowed to even talk about some x dot mu, which doesn't satisfy this constraint. So this constraint is a new equation of motion in the action with capital G. It was never there in the action without capital. Okay, fine. But the other equation you get by varying that, namely the x equation, is just the geodesic equation, and now it's equal to zero because the extra term was g dot upon g. But now we have set g equals one or any constant, so we are free to put that in that equation and get rid of the g dot over g term. Okay. Now see the beauty of it. Finally, in this system, what is the relation between p mu and x mu? Well, p mu we saw was we saw that p lower mu was one by g g mu mu mu, or if we work with p upper mu, it's even simpler. It's one by g mu. Okay. So by setting g to one, I have set p mu equals x dot mu. Notice that now the relation between p and x dot has nothing to do with the mass of the particle. P is just x dot. But if I wanted to choose the gauge where g is two or three, then p would be one by two or one by root two or any number times x dot. If I wanted to choose the gauge where g is one by n squared. Then p would be m times x dot. Why is that? Look here. What does it mean to say g is one by m square? It's exactly the same as saying that this numerator is one, which is exactly the choice of tau which corresponds to the proper term. Okay. So we understand now why the relation p mu equals m x dot mu was coming because we were always working with tau being the proper term, and we can have that too now for a massive particle. But actually, we can have any coefficient we like here for a massive particle, as well as any coefficient we like for a massless particle. It's entirely a choice of gauge. Anything we like. Okay. The only thing that's not negotiable is this equation is always true with the parameter m that we put in the equation. So if we put m for a massive particle, then this equation has to be true for a massive particle. If we have a mass, if we have a photon, then it will be. And now, so the final bottom line is that for a photon, the natural thing to do is choose g to be one, and p mu is x dot mu. It's very strange because we are using the same relation between p mu and x dot mu as we use for massive particles, but instead of m, we are putting one. It's very confusing if you look at any book. Okay, they say well we can't use the proper term anymore. Instead, we'll say that p mu is some arbitrary constant and x dot, and we'll take that constant to be one. Doesn't mean the mass of the photon is one. Obviously, that would be too much. Okay. What it means is that we can actually choose this to be any. This constant is absolutely no physical thing. Okay. As long as you do everything correct. So, this set of equations, from now on, for the photon, just take this to be the set of equations and ending zero, end of the story. And p, we will put the x dot here. Yeah. This is the correct geodesic equation. This is the condition that the geodesic is null. Okay. Yes. Only for so we learn now that the miniature cosmological constant is the mass. So really, it's there only for massive particles. So the photon is the particle with no miniature, with zero value. Okay, good. 
So now with all this, and just to convince you that it was not a purely idle exercise, let's convincingly write down what happens. For a photon, using micron that we've been working with before. So we'll recycle everything we did before. We have that the conserved energy is minus k mu p mu. So now we write it as minus k mu extra. Okay. The physical interpretation, by the way, is different. Uh, you can't anymore say this is the energy per unit mass. You remember, because there was a mass parameter between these two. Earlier, this was called the energy per unit mass for massive particles. So, for this, the natural quantity is just the energy. Or you can take it to be the energy per unit some parameter, which would be the value of g, which would be the mass. Need not be. That's the same statement as tau equals property. Yeah, so uh, there was not Yeah, but that was that's correct, but that was after fixing the gauge. It was fixing the gauge which gave a constraint on x dot. But this x dot has a constraint in any gauge. If I don't fix g it's over here, it's one by g. Even before I fix the gauge, for the photon, for example, the equation was 1 by capital G times this thing equals 0. So this thing is equal to 0. I haven't fixed the gauge. It's natural that x dot is constrained when I fix the gauge. But in this formalism, it's constrained even if I don't fix the gauge. In the massless case. Yes. I mean, when m is non-zero, you could say that it's not constrained because G can be solved for. When m is non-zero, this equation determines g, the factor 1 by g in front of that. But when m is zero, it's a pure constraint on x. Okay, good. So this, of course, we've already gone through all this. I'm just going to be recycling the same equations. And actually now, if there was somebody wanting to be very critical of what I did, they would point out that just with two or three words, I could have as well convinced you of what I was going to do now without doing all this. So it's really for, for, more for my pleasure than yours that we went through all that. There's really nothing very new about what we are going to do here. So u and x dot are the same thing for me. And here it is r squared u5. So these equations we saw last time. And uh, now we have to implement g mu nu x dot mu x dot mu equals 0. So this equation, if you uh, arrange it, comes to minus e square from the first term as before plus r dot square from the second term. In the last term, we get this and the whole thing is 0. Notice that when it wasn't 0, but when there was a constant 1 on the right side and multiplying by this thing and bringing that to the other side, one of the terms in all of this was the Newtonian potential Gm of 1R. Okay? Now we are going to not find that term at all. It's not obvious that you have to just put it to 0, but that's what has happened. Of course, remember that the Newtonian approximation of the non relativistic approximation is as bad as it gets for photons, which are never non relativistic so now that we are doing photons, we shouldn't too much try to compare with the non okay. So now the equation is half. I can't. I don't have an m, so I can't say half m r dot square. But this plus a potential v of r is equal to v e square by two, which as before I equal to e, and the potential is now just l square by r square one minus. So what 
we notice from this is that
So we see that general relativity always makes it more possible for things to fall in. Okay, if they would like to fall in, they can fall in. The barriers are all finite. Just from this picture you can see that enough of an energy will always send you over this. Okay, now I said that, but that's actually a misleading statement. And let me explain why. Let's calculate the energy required to go over the barrier. For that we just need the height of the barrier. So we are equals three gm is one by two p four l squared one squared. So e greater than b
So, there is a big circle around the center of this star and basically now if I want a photon to fall in, then from a far away So basically if I aim my photon like this, it is going to escape, but if I aim it like this, it is going to get caught, because in that energy picture it goes over the barrier. How is it actually going to get caught? Well, it is not going to suddenly turn around and go in here, it is perfectly, it is legitimately allowed to get closer and closer while maintaining its angular momentum and spiraling. Okay. But here you are, this is pretty shocking, of course we, we can't say all that because we really don't know what's inside yet, we haven't come to that, but nominally at least you could have something such that the behavior of, of a light ray is to spiral in, but in Newtonian mechanics, once it has any angular momentum at all, it's never going to spiral. So we see that these are very, very strongly non-Newtonian mechanics. It's a possibility. On the other hand, if it is going to go like this, then it will go off to infinity and there will be an angle, delta phi, and this is calculable from the equations we have got and we are going to calculate it, modulo my severe inability to do integrals, so at least I will reduce it to an integral. I spent two hours in the afternoon today because I found everybody uses some fudging method or other and I was trying to do it honestly but I don't think so. So it's an elliptic integral. I wouldn't even mind telling you that the value of the integral as per Gradstein and Rajek's book is this much, but I didn't even find it over there, so I'm working on it. Uh, anyway, so the question, uh, before I go on, just one uh, point here. Uh, it's natural to, de uh, to define a capture cross section. Another thing one thinks about in particle physics, if B is the impact parameter which is 3 root 3 gm, then the cross section is pi b squared, it is just the area of the spherical body which is presenting itself to an incoming photon, uh, which is the area, effective area in which it will be taken in. Okay, so the, cap the cross section for capture, so that is just uh, I can only take the square 27 pi. Find r dot. I just have to solve that equation. 
half r dot squared plus c e is equal to curly e. So r dot very familiar expression. That okay. So that I need to put in the denominator here. So that square root of so two curly e is ordinary e square. So if I know the trajectory r of t, r of tau, then that appears here, here, and here, and so I've got del phi by del r as a function of r. In fact, I don't need to now know the trajectory r of tau. Now it's all in terms of r. So I just have to integrate it, and I have to integrate it from minus infinity incoming light ray to plus infinity. Okay. In this picture, since it has a big impact parameter, is not going to get absorbed. In the energy picture, that means it has a low energy to angular momentum ratio, or it has a the low energy to angular momentum ratio, so high L by E, uh, and therefore it hits this barrier and gets reflected back. Okay. In, the, in the energy picture, what the particle is doing, this particle, is that here this system is coming in like this, hitting here at the turning point, and then going back. Okay.
we have done now. Now what we do is to replace E and L, take them out and replace them in terms of P. P is equal to L by E. And you can see here that this thing scales exactly as a function of L by E. It's linear in L in the numerator and linear in E and L. So you can get this sort of expression. So now it's just a simple matter to calculate this 
for example, around the sun. You plug in the mass of the sun here. Uh, you plug in something for B, I guess. And uh, for example, huh? so B is of course this way we wouldn't know. We don't know how. We don't know what kind of light is necessarily going to be there. But what we can do is just choose since B has dimensions of length. Just choose how close to the surface of the sun it is. You choose that is right on the surface of the sun. So let B be the radius of the sun. Now I will give it to you. And probably to get a number in terms of angle, you probably need to put back some C square. Like a B C square, whatever it is, should be dimensionless. And you get a number. I have forgotten that number. But in the class here, next time we will, if I can, I will tell you what the number and the test that is done. And also how to evaluate this individually. But if it's too boring, then instead of that, I will talk about the massive. I will go back to the massive. Which we really didn't finish discussing because that's the case where this precession of the Anyway, one thing I would like you to take away is that it's all very easy, really speaking. We haven't really had to do any hard struggle to get to the sun. It's only an elliptic interview like one of the you can always ask somebody else to do it. This is the answer. And uh, it's, a, it's an experimental measurement. Okay. Now, uh, next Tuesday is election day. and told that we always been arrested if we have a class, so I still want to have a class. That we give to them. Huh? It's an election day, it's a holiday, all restaurants, cinemas, discos, bars are closed. <laughs> I think you are still allowed to watch TV in the privacy of your homes. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm sure, I'm sure you will all go and vote, but this class is at 2 p.m. so that gives you the whole morning.